Our next session, uh, speaker in the session is Pat Lucy. Um, delighted to welcome Pat, uh, he's recently incoming president uh, and now president of the Construction Industry Federation. Uh, I congratulate Pat on uh, his recent elevation to the role. Uh, wish him every success in his presidency. Uh, the CIF has supported us uh, greatly in the conference since uh, 2009 when we started talking about it. We wondered uh, would we have an industry left and uh, we'll just hear had uh, great positivity there from John. Uh, so we've had great uh, support from the CIF president, so I'm sure that uh, great relationship will continue under Pat's stewardship. Um, Pat is the director of John Sisk and Sons, uh, with responsibility for the civil engineering business unit in both Ireland and the UK. Uh, after graduating from UCC, he joined MC O'Sullivan Engineering Company. Uh, in the late 80s, Pat uh, joined Christiani and Nielsen and spent six years working in the UK. Uh, Pat returned to Ireland to join John Sisk's and Son in 1993. For the last 22 years, has been a key member of their civil engineering team. Uh, Pat is also currently president of the Civil Engineering Contractors Association. Uh, today, Pat's going to consider the opportunities and issues posed by the National Development Plan and also give us some of his vision of the construction industry and how it may develop. Thanks, Pat. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Martin, for the invitation and to the department. Much appreciated. I suppose after that uh, positive and uplifting message from John, um, I think it's important that you're conscious of the underlying message that he had there as well from the story of the tower cranes, um, because we don't have a single operating economy here. And just to reinforce that message, I'm just going to show you a photograph of the cover of the construction magazine which shows a divided Ireland from the edition of July-August 2017. So basically, we've got all this activity on the East Coast. We've got the wider pale with connections and people traveling in. And then we've got four parts of Ireland adrift. That was 2017. It's still the case in 2019. So my topic here today is the National Development Plan, Opportunities and Issues for the Construction Industry. There's quite a lot in that. And I'm conscious of something I came across a few months ago when my wife was looking up different approaches to education. She came across a learning pyramid. And basically it gave average retention rates for different forms of learning. So for example, if we teach others, we will retain about 90% of it. If we're in a discussion group, we'll retain about 50% of it. But if we're at a lecture, we'll retain only 5% of it. So if I speak here for 30 minutes, you will probably only remember one and a half minutes of what I say. So what one and a half minutes do I want you to remember? Well, let's see. Certainly in what John said, I'd like you to remember the story about the tower cranes. I've been in this industry for the best part of 40 years. Some of you are only getting started. So today I want to talk about the construction industry you'll inherit in 2020, the construction industry you'll lead in 2040, and the construction industry you will pass on to the next generation in 2060. I'm going to break this into a couple of different strands, starting with learning from the past. Back in 2005 and up to 2012, I was giving a procurement module uh, in the postgraduate diploma course in Trinity. I had experience of procurement in Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales. Each jurisdiction had its very own different ways. And even in my career to that point, the repetitive, cyclical nature of the industry was so obvious. To get the point across to those on the course, I used this quotation from Josiah Charles Stamp. It rang a bell with me about what we were seeing in construction. Now, Mr. Stamp was the son of a shop owner in London. He joined the civil service when he was 16, 
went to college at night time, got a first class honours degree when he was 31 years old. He was an economist, he was a statistician. He left the civil service and went into industry. He became an extremely wealthy man. He was a director of the Bank of England. He was a chairman of a railroad. He was a man who came from ordinary beginnings and he was on the inside of the banking profession and then he wrote that message. So little did I know in 2005 what was going to happen in 2007 and 2008. But it begs the question, why don't we learn? Will the construction industry be a fine example of Einstein's definition of insanity forever? I'm going to read an excerpt from a speech made by another CIF president. In it, the issues militating against innovation in the construction industry are outlined. These were, the sector has low profit margins and an inequitable distribution of technological risk and financial reward. The sector is mostly driven by the pressures of time, cost and programme, rather than quality and value in the delivery of its products and services. Many construction procurers and tenants are technically unsophisticated and are thus unable to recognise improved value that can flow from innovative processes. There is a heavy reliance on lowest tender contracting systems. Labour shortages still exist in certain trades, i.e. tiling and plastering. The industry's image affects its ability to attract the best employees. While some innovation does occur, its spread rate is slow. Much of the industry tends to be closer to the trailing edge than the leading edge. Research and development investment is very low compared to every other industry. There is no investment in research into process or management practices. The industry is fragmented into many self-interest groups. This speech was made by Kevin Kelly at the CIF's Construction Industry Awards in the City West Hotel in 2004, 15 years ago and as relevant today as it was then. In this country, we actually have a tremendous opportunity to learn from the past through the close association with the United Kingdom. We used to say that whatever is tried in the UK will come to Ireland 10 years later, and it was true. With that time lag, it should be possible to learn from their mistakes and their successes. And yet that's not what happens. We actually repeat the same mistakes. Public sector procurement most certainly hasn't benefited from lessons learned. And since the recession, the public sector has lo lost a lot of experience and they also are only recovering in terms of resource and capacity. The system-wide transformation required in public sector procurement hasn't been prioritised. However, the government now recognises that to achieve maximum value for the $116 billion outlined in the National Development Plan, the public sector procurement system must be transformed. While we expect reforms that will improve the procurement process, until they are revealed, we cannot be sure. The last major reform of the public procurement system damaged the industry so badly it will take years more to recover. And it is desperately important that the lessons are learned from those mistakes. Last year, about 70 contractors went into examinership. Nobody benefits, least of all the taxpayers. When contractors get into trouble on public sector projects awarded on the basis of lowest cost tender criteria. I'm a big believer in early contractor involvement. Essentially, contractors are bought into, brought into the scheme development much earlier so problems can be preempted and addressed and the project management skills of the contractor bring significant improvement to the scheme timeline. The process has worked exceptionally well on a number of projects I have worked on. The practice should be used more often by the public sector. If we learn from the past, we can shape the present and build the future. But it is very often said that the only thing we learn from the past is that we don't learn from the past. Let's hope the next generation can change that. 
that last couple of minutes might be the one and a half I want you to remember. If it is, I won't be disappointed. I must mention one positive example of learning, and it is in relation to safety. Safety is paramount. By learning from safety failures in the past, we have shaped a safer environment for our employees today. And this is crucial to attracting and retaining you, the future leaders of our industry. The Health and Safety Authority recently commended the efforts of the industry in relation to safety. This is a collaborative and collective effort, and it shows what this industry can do when we are aligned. One accident is one too many, and we can never get complacent. So, as the students in the room today, as you start to inherit this industry, please keep safety at the centre of everything you do in the future. Don't let it slide or let complacency set in. Let me tell you about one of my proudest moments in construction. We were involved in a tunnelling contract in Crossrail, 11.8 kilometres of twin board tunnel. Uh, we were awarded a contract at the end of 2010, kicked off in January 2011. By 2013, we were in full stride tunnelling, and in the course of the tunnelling, which is really heavy civil engineering, there were a number of accidents, uh, and there were life-changing accidents for the people involved. We put every effort we could into turning that around, and we were through supporting the site team, successful in reaching one million man-hours without a lost time incident. So we got all the teams together, all the workers, and we brought them into the different canteens. There was a thousand people working on the job. I was in one particular canteen where we wanted to end up with a list of what was good about the project from the workers' point of view. So we came up with a technique that got them to relax and... and, and uh, say what their thoughts were. And we got it up on a whiteboard, and just as we were about to finish, there was a young man, he was about 20 years old, and he was sitting in the front, and I could see he wanted to say something, because uh, he just hand up a little bit up, and I said, what do you want to say? And he said, no pressure. There was no pressure on them to do anything that was unsafe. So to come from where we were to a point where a very young member of the workforce was able to say, if they saw something unsafe, they could just stop. That was brilliant. We actually ended up finishing the job with one and three quarter million man hours without a lost time incident. And uh, for a five year project, which is a very big job, that actually sticks in my mind a lot more than an awful lot of other things. The next issue I want to address is the boom and bust cycle. We must end the boom and bust in our industry. Now, I know there's a natural economic cycle in any industrial sector. In ours, however, the amplitude of the cycle is too volatile. The CIF is working with the government to identify the parameters of a Goldilocks zone for our industry where, for example, housing output and capital investment can be monitored as an early warning system. This is very relevant to the topic of today's talk, the National Development Plan. My central point is that to deliver the NDP in the most efficient manner, the government must work with the construction industry to rebuild the capacity of the industry in a sustainable way and to spread best practice and technologies across the 50,000 plus companies that constitute the Irish construction ecosystem. The National Development Plan is a major step in the right direction in terms of ending boom and bust. The investment package of $116 billion over the next decade could transform the country's economy. Its sister strategy, the National Planning Framework, or Project Ireland 2040, could transform Irish societies. Both strategies are entirely dependent on this industry. There is no doubt that there is a lot more positivity around the industry than in the past decade. Most of the indicators are on the up. Civil engineering is the one sector that hasn't recovered due to the low investment in infrastructure for more than 10 years. This should be a matter of great concern to all of us as infrastructure is directly related to the performance of the economy as a whole. Let me read a paragraph from the BUILD document published by the Department of Finance last week. 
So this is the bill document which replaces the old DKM report that they used to do for the Department of the Environment. So in section 1.1, the overview, they state, following the economic downturn, public infrastructure that had been put in place over the past two decades played an important role in supporting the resilience and recovery of the Irish economy. However, in the years following the crisis, public investment was significantly reduced to safeguard the provision of essential public services. It goes on to say, Project Ireland 2040 represents a decisive response to these deficits and identifies strategic priorities for public capital investment for all sectors. That's true, but it's not happening quick enough. We now have an infrastructure project tracker which lists 271 projects currently. It's going online and it will provide transparency of up-to-date information on a staged basis of the top infrastructure projects in the pipeline. The CIF is working with the government to develop this tracker as it is a key component in the certainty required by industry to invest in our businesses, people and technologies over the next decade. There is another point worth noting from the national figures. I know many of the construction companies present here today are still only in recovery mode. These positive national figures are largely driven by activity in the Greater Dublin area. They mask the fact that outside the Greater Dublin area there is an absence of work to sustain construction businesses in the regions. This regional disparity in construction activity needs to be monitored and resolved if we are to have any chance of delivering the National Development Plan. Slavishly following national statistics could mask underlying systems failures at regional levels. But dealing with the regional disparity is about more than construction. It's fundamental to a better Ireland. West of the Shannon, you saw at first hand the very real improvements for a great many local communities when the Gartatum motorway was opened. Looking at a map of the road network as we have it now versus the 1906 rail network, you'd have to question, have we made progress in our main forms of getting around the country? As you can see from the map, of the motorway network, there are still gaps. John mentioned uh, Cork to Limerick, and since you've mentioned it, I'll, I'll continue. Cork to Limerick is a great example of what we are not doing right. Everybody believes that we need to develop a counterbalance to the east and the Dublin area. The project from Cork to Limerick will cost in excess of a billion euros. It will take 13 years or so to deliver. They have appointed designers only recently. But the work that has to be done for the first four and five years of that project will probably only cost about 15 million. But the timeline can't really be shortened. That time has to be spent to get the project to the point of planning. So why aren't we starting these projects sooner rather than waiting for some big event that actually causes us to press the button, but then we have to wait five years before we can go to planning. Delivering the National Development Plan is a transformative opportunity for Irish construction that we must seize. It's not enough to simply build out 116 billion of infrastructure and get our volume of housing outputs up to 35,000 a year. We need to do this, but we must also use this pipeline to work to become leaders in innovative construction. This time, to deliver the NDP efficiently, and in doing so, in boom and bust, we must do enhance our productivity, developing, not just adopting new technologies and practices, delivering a sustainable built environment in the most sustainable manner possible, provide amazing careers for young men and women. This is the vision the CIF has for the Irish construction industry to build an industry characterised by smart, sustainable and stable growth, the government and industry are beginning to collaborate on spreading modern construction techniques throughout the supply chain. 
Within the NDP is the acknowledgement that it's only through collaboration on issues like skills, procurement, productivity and regulation that we can deliver its, um, its ambition. The next strand I want to talk about is people. Top of the list of concerns is skills. Demand for skilled workers will outstrip supply for the coming decade and we need to act now to prevent acute skilled shortages in the future. The CIF, DKM, IBEC, the OECD, the ESRI have all recently identified skilled shortages as a major barrier to cost-effective delivery of construction. A recent CIF survey found construction companies across Ireland are experiencing difficulties recruiting qualified, experienced and even entry-level workers across most disciplines. Respondents reported a severe lack of engineers, quantity surveyors, foremen, project managers, general operatives, ground workers and apprentices. 74% of those surveyed said that these recruitment issues are having a direct effect on their company's ability to deliver projects on time. With, 90, with 79 per cent of respondents reporting that difficulties with recruitment are negatively affecting their business. It is an ongoing concern that only 5.5 per cent of our workforce is female. We cannot build a modern industry on this basis. The low level of women choosing the industry as a career has to be addressed. The CIF's Building Equality campaign is ongoing and highlighting the stories of many of the accomplished females working on the industry on the basis that you have to see it to be it. I personally want to work in an industry where my daughters feel welcome and can build a career on-site or off-site. I'd like to take a moment to show you a video we produced to promote careers in the industry. I think it captures the essence of the campaign really well. I'm going to show you a video of a building that was recently built in Dublin. So this is the building in Dublin that's newly finished. And it's got special white glass at the front and bronze shading at the back. Who likes the white glass at the front? Me. 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 Who do you think could have built this building? Who put this building there? Builders. Builders? Architects, yeah. Then yeah. what do builders look like? There will be very strong, quite big. Oh, yes. They have hard hats. And what do you think they were wearing on their feet? Boots. 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 Black boots. Yes. So now that you've seen the video, now I have a surprise for you guys. It was actually me who built the building. So, hands up, who'd like to be a builder? <laughs> that has proved to be quite an effective video to get the message across. And we're not looking for increased diversity to tick a box. We're looking for increased diversity because it improves our industry. You get a better balance of decision making if you have got different inputs into it. So greater diversity will make us a better industry going forward. And interestingly, a colleague who had seen the, the CIF's equality campaign asked me, what was the CIF doing for wider diversity? The point was that with the industry comprising of 95% men, there are probably more gay men in the industry than women. The following question was, what was the industry doing to ensure that LGBTI person felt they could work in the industry or indeed be unguarded about their sexuality or gender issues? The CIF has developed an industry-wide diversity policy for its members. It's a small step, but it's important. 
Next, we're developing a diversity mark for companies who reach a certain standard. I want the logo for diversity to be as sought after by companies as a CIF, a Siri, or a Safety Cert logo. In addition to attracting young people into the industry and those in the diaspora, the government must match the ambition of the NDP by an equally ambitious investment in education and training. Worryingly, enrolment figures are down, not up, at a time when construction activity and future demand is increasing. This concept of building lives, careers and communities will be the central theme of a major national awareness campaign to be rolled out in the second half of this year. It's a given that the industry has more to do to attract young people into our industry and against the backdrop of the National Development Plan. We need to connect our profession with that noble purpose in the hearts and minds of the children, the parents and the teachers of Ireland. I hope all of you today will support the campaign. I want each of you to be an advocate for our industry. That might be leading by example through the quality of your work, your professionalism and your commitment to safety and well-being. I hope that GMIT will support this campaign and our outreach programme to secondary schools next year. The next strand I want to touch on is research and innovation. Last year, my predecessor, Dominic Dohany, lamented the low levels of support for research and innovation in construction. The team in GMIT responded almost immediately and pulled as many of the researchers with an interest in construction across Ireland together. They established with industry Ireland's only construction research forum. This group met last year to kick off and it will now aim to place the industry at the centre of the government's innovation strategy. By the time the next CIF president addresses this group, I hope to see at least one centre of excellence and plans well underway for at least one Enterprise Ireland technology centre. There are currently 51 Enterprise Ireland technology centres, none focus on construction. In the past, we might have shrugged and got on with our work. But to build a sustainable and stable industry, we need to mobilise, get organised and make a compelling case to government for investment in research, development and innovation in construction. There is another challenge for GMIT and other third level institutions to respond to. It should acquire the latest construction technology, upskill academic staff and reshape curricula to reflect the changing requirements of industry, student and state. It should also prime the pump of third level research into construction, something that Ireland inexcusably does not prioritise in our national science and innovation strategies. There is no mention of construction in the government's innovation 2020 strategy. I hope that we as an industry, in conjunction with GMIT and others in the third level sector, will be able to collectively ensure that construction gains prominence in the next iteration of the strategy due to be started in the coming months. If we make a compelling case, the government should be willing to invest in increased, increasing the industry's capacity and the research into construction technology. One final strand I want to touch on is accommodation. I recently met with the IDA and the lack of housing, particularly apartment building, was their biggest concern in relation to attracting and retaining foreign direct investment. Several country managers of global corporations have all cited housing and accommodation for their employees as a major issue. Yet the regional house builders I speak to since I became president cannot secure finance to deliver units outside the Dublin area where there is a real demand. To address this, the government have put in place a huge amount of initiatives through Rebuilding Ireland and successive budgets to stimulate housing and accommodation supply. The Help to Buy scheme, the Local Infrastructure Housing Activation Fund, House Building Finance Ireland initiative have all reduced costs provided finance and stimulated supply. And it is turning. The number of units is increasing year on year. But again, like infrastructure, you can't just throw a switch 
and be building vast number of houses the next day. Preparation work is required. House builders estimate that about 50% of the new stock has been enabled by the Help to Buy scheme. This initiative must be retained and extended. It is critical in achieving the 35,000 houses per annum that the ESRI and others believe we need to meet our growing population's demand. So to finalise, by the time one of you is up here addressing the next generation of students, I want the industry's reputation as a haven of world-class talent to be consolidated. I want you students here today to be as highly respected in Irish society as any profession. I want you to work in an industry that is seen as a key enabler of Irish social, economic and cultural life. I want the everyday person to walk down the street and realise the quality of the built environment that this industry delivers. Reputation is key. The industry welcomed the Building Control Regulations, or BCAR, when they were published in 2014, but the industry is taking further steps to ensure quality in construction. In 2014, the CIF established CIRI, the Construction Industry Register Ireland, a register of competent builders and contractors in Ireland. For the consumer, the CIRI logo is a sign of quality and competence in construction. In time, our aim is to have the consumer demand and pay a premium to companies for CIRI built homes. We also intend that CIRI registration will become a stipulation in awarding public sector contracts. Currently, over 800 companies have fully registered with a further 1,100 applications at various stages of the registration process. When it is put on a statutory footing, an estimated 15,000 construction enterprises will have to register with Siri if they want to operate in the industry. A note of optimism for the National Development Plan was the establishment of the construction sector group within the National Development Plan. It's a key step towards the vision the industry has characterised by smart, sustainable growth. We are currently having frank discussions with government departments and other representatives on the steps needed to take this industry forward. So what one and a half minutes do I want you to remember from today? I think learning lessons from the past is absolutely crucial. We're failing it all the time. Perhaps the next generation can do something about it. But the one other main thing is you have to do the preparatory work for any single scheme that you want to do in construction. We have a system. We all know what the system is. The system has a timeline. It's no good for us to complain about people putting in objections. They are entitled to put in objections. But you have to start the project early enough to allow enough time for it to be delivered when you need it delivered on the ground. When I was in school, we had a chemistry teacher who loved to talk about entropy and how everything tended towards disorder. And everything does tend towards disorder unless people intervene and actually make positive steps to improve things. So I hope that some of the students here today will be positive in their careers and take positive steps to improve the industry that we are in. Thank you for the opportunity to talk here today. I wish you all well in your future careers. Thank you.